Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. Evening listeners, welcome to Midnight Chats. It's Thursday night, it's late. It's officially the most depressing week of the year, officially for me anyway. The clocks have just gone back, it gets darker earlier in the evenings, it's cold, it's miserable, the Great British Bake Off has just finished and winter hasn't even really begun yet. But hey, we try not to wallow on midnight chats and I'm actually looking on the positive side because tonight's episode of the podcast I think is a real warmer, a real cracker. I'm not going to give you the full history of my guest because you know Primal Scream and you know Bobby Gillespie and there's no way we were going to comprehensively cover the story of his 30 years in music in a shortish podcast. So it's fortunate that the album Primal Scream released a couple of weeks ago zones in on a very specific period for the band. It's called Give Out But Don't Give Up, the original Memphis recordings. And I won't go into too much detail because Bobby sets the scene pretty nicely in the conversation you're about to hear. But in a nutshell, back in 1993, Primal Scream had just won the Mercury Prize for Scream of Delica. They were suddenly a very big deal. There was a lot of heat, a lot of attention, a lot of pressure on them. And they headed to the legendary Ardent Studios in Memphis to record the follow-up with producer Tom Dowd. Now, he was known for his work with Ray Charles, Otis Redding, Aretha Franklin, legends of soul music. Um, But he wasn't necessarily associated with rock bands like Primal Scream. And after a while, the band realised it wasn't turning out maybe the way they wanted and when they got back they reworked and re-recorded the album with a new producer the album you'll know as give out but don't give up which has tracks like rocks and free on them now fast forward almost 25 years and andrew innes from the band found those original tapes from those memphis sessions in his basement and they decided to share them with the world Now, they haven't just put the music they rediscovered out, but also made a documentary about this time. It's broadcast on BBC4 on the 16th of November, and it's a really moving, funny and passionate portrait, not just of the Primal Scream story, particularly those early years back in Glasgow, but specifically the time they spent in the Deep South around the making of this album, and Bobby and Andrew travel back to Memphis in the film. You've got some big personalities who were close to it, who helped tell the story. So Noel Gallagher, Alan McGee, they're entertaining in it with their punchlines. But beyond that, I found it quite a moving watch, really, Um, particularly the contributions from ex-Primal Scream singer Denise Johnson and Bobby's emotional memories of guitarist Robert Young, who played on this album but passed away a few years ago. And you maybe think of Bobby as a lot of swagger, bravado, maybe a little bit formidable. That's there, but above all, it's a very tender, vulnerable film and brilliantly done. So yeah, check that out. Hopefully it'll be on BBC iPlayer afterwards as well. Before we get into that conversation, if you're listening to this podcast for the first time, the second time, or maybe you've been with us for a little while, please do subscribe to Midnight Chats wherever you're listening to this. You'll get an alert, a reminder every time we put out a new episode each week on a Thursday at midnight. And please do comment and rate and share all that stuff that helps spread the word. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode, by the way, Stuart speaking to Cat Power. I thought that one was particularly good, so do check that out if you haven't already. We also have a new issue of the magazine we make, Loud and Quiet, out this weekend. Tons in there. Jimothy Lacoste is on the cover and interviews with the likes of the Beastie Boys and Gets. Loads and loads of great new music. 
loudandquiet.com to get hold of that. But back to tonight's guest, Bobby Gillespie. I'd only met Bobby once before, about two years ago now. We went record shopping for a video series we make at Loud and Quiet called Bands by Records. It's on YouTube if you want to check that out. Not long after that, Bobby had a really serious accident where he fell off stage at a festival in Switzerland and broke his back in four places. He had to travel by air ambulance back to the UK for treatment. So that's why I started by asking him about that, in case you're wondering, and the rest I won't spoil. So here we go, episode 59 of Midnight Chats with Bobby Gillespie. Last time I saw you was about two years ago and we went to a great little record store in Camden Town in North London. A couple of weeks after that, I read that you'd had your, your accident on stage um, with Primal Scream in Switzerland at the festival. And um, I was just wondering how you are because I haven't seen you since then and that sounded pretty serious. Uh, it was a serious accident. I, I broke my back in four places uh, and I was out for a couple of months and, um, I, you know, I was... It was serious, you know. I'm, I'm lucky that I can walk, and um, but I'm fine now, you know. I'm fine. I, I'm good. Everything's back to normal, and um, it was a, it, it was an inter- it was an interesting experience. Yeah. <laughs> was it one um, of those moments where you thought, I, I, you did you know immediately you'd done something very very serious? Yeah, okay, yeah. Immediately, I had the ground, and you, it was bad. Mm. I knew it was bad. Are you still living with like the effects of it? Like, do you have to go through physio and all that kind of thing after that? Yes, I, I had to do physio. Um, I had to do all sorts of exercises. Um, yeah, and I was on like heavier drugs as well. I was a uh, tramadol. Oh. I was like on like eight it's the a serious day, stuff. <laughs> eight tramadol a day, I think. Or, and um, towards the, you know, when the you have to st- start stepping the tramadol down, and. Um, I think it was six weeks in, I started to, to to see a physio guy and he gave me some exercises and that was good. And um, yeah. I mean, you mentioned like you're concerned about, you know, the basics of being able to walk again, but were you also thinking like, how is this going to affect my performances uh, on stage? No, because uh, the I was taken to hospital directly after the, the fall and... Um, they shot me up with morphine. Um, at this point, no one knew what the extent of the damage was. They let, I was lying on a slab, you know, like kind of a stretcher type thing for a couple of hours. And then they x-rayed me. I couldn't stand up to be x-rayed, uh, so they had to do it. So they had to turn, I don't know what, lying down. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. And um, and they gave me more morphine, and then I, I, I kind of fell asleep that night, and I woke up the next morning, and, uh, you know, like, really shot, full of morphine, uh, and I started to come back to consciousness, and, I, you know, I'm in a hospital, uh, I'm in this tiny room, um, you know, I've, what's wrong, you know, when I wonder what I've done, I wonder what the damage is, will I be able to walk again, um, I didn't know. So the the doctors come in um, after my breakfast. Doctors come in and uh, they say we get some good news, we get some bad news. And uh, I said the bad news is you've broken your back in four places. The good news is they're good breaks. <laughs> 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 and um, did you make a joke saying I've had a few good breaks in my career? <laughs> and I was like, all right, and. Um, he said, because, you know, they will heal and, you know, you'll be able to walk and, you you, you know, a couple of months you'll be okay. But you're going to be out for a couple of months. You you can't do any physical activity. And I um, said, um, so, you know, had the brakes were on bones at the front of my vertebrae. Had and sort of spur bits between the vertebrae. And um, had they been on, in, on the back where all the nerves are, I think they would, might have had to operate and... Um, that could have been tricky, and but as it happens, uh, it, they were just there was four fractures, and um, I just had to wear a chest brace for a couple of months, and uh, I was at home, you know, I spent a lot of time in bed, 
and I was very tired. I was exhausted because the body's the body uses all the energy from you know food and stuff and sleep uh, to to repair itself. And so I slept a lot. The body demanded that I sleep, and I did. You know, I just watched a lot of films. And even that, I couldn't sit in the living room and watch a film. I couldn't sit. Did you have to be like flat on your back? Normal, or yeah, because or I had a chest tool. brace on. It was metal chest brace, so. Um, I had to just lie on my back and I had this, uh, you know, got a stand to put an iPad on and I, I just watch a film, half a film, and I just doze off. And I never listened to music either the whole time. I think um, it was very strange. I, I know, you know, normally I listen to music all the time. Well, maybe I was in heavy drugs and um, I think maybe, um, I don't know, I was thinking a lot, you know. I don't want to hear music. The only music I really listened to was at night in my bed and I'd get headphones on when the lights went out and I would listen to some tracks by George Harrison, All Things Must Pass, Beware of Darkness, and the other one that was um, Isn't It A Pity. Real, real healing music. And yeah, I listened to them every night, you know. I think there's a lot of love in those records and, and in those songs and... um. Yeah, very spiritual, and um, yeah, that 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 was a bit. And uh, then when I was sort of getting a bit better and I could walk a bit better and stuff, I listened a lot to Tom Petty's Greatest Hits. <laughs> Amazing, <laughs> just motivational music then, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I was, I was get you going. <laughs> listen to Tom, and I, you know, I'd play it loud to the speakers, and yeah, and that made me. I want to. I want to be in a band again. You know, yeah. it's great though to hear that that kind of stuff can play a role in part of the recuperation from something like that i mean sure there's the painkillers but then there's also just the uh, the other stuff that goes with it well, to I get you up and going painkillers i had to i was on them for like four or five weeks six weeks and um i i, I, had, I came off and i think it's when i came off that I started listening to like faster stuff like tom Petty, you know more high energy yeah. finally worked your way back up to like the cramps and stages yeah and then i was like right i gotta, I gotta get back on stage with the band you know yeah what was that first show back like after you'd um, injured yourself because were you a bit cautious or uh, the first show back um it was in glasgow okay uh well it was so a big like hometown seven gig seven weeks i think after the break after the fall and i had um i sang a lot of it uh sitting in a chair in a high chair and then for a couple of numbers i stood up and just sort of hung on at the mic then you know i couldn't dance you know i was it, so we did a did a couple of shows like that and then I went on holiday to America and um, I was getting better by that point, end of August. The injury, the fall happened I think on the 2nd of June and then m maybe midway through September we did a gig with Massive Attack uh, at, at the Downs in Bristol in front of 30,000 people and um, I started moving again, you know, I was, had the mic and I was running to the edge of the stage and, you know, I was... I'd been doing a lot of physio and swimming and stuff and a, a bit of running and I'm always uh, ready to rock. <laughs> okay, good. So I'm all right. <laughs> good. Let's start with talking about the Primal Screen record that's about to come out. It's actually coming out this week, but there's also, by the time that people hear this podcast, there will also be an accompanying documentary that goes with it that, that kind of adds some more context to it. But Give Out But Never Give Up, the Memphis sessions, uh, the recordings, for people that aren't entirely familiar with the context and the time, what was going on, just start by telling us a little bit of the story. It's 1993, um, Screamadelic has been out, you're following that up with a new record, you decide to head to Memphis to try something different as Primal Scream have done consistently throughout your career. But what was going through yourself and the band's minds when you were thinking, right, we're going to head to the deep south and make a new record? The songs that we uh, wrote uh, after touring Schemedelica quite extensively were rock songs you know rock country soul ballads mostly country soul ballads kind of dark um, damaged country soul ballads and um, you know with guitar riffs and it was a step away from Schemedelica and working with samplers and drum loops and you know Andrew Weatherall and uh, Alex Parson and um, you know, Weatherall by 1992, 93, had he he was uh, getting he was sort of getting a harder, more extreme techno. You know, very unemotional. <laughs> but Andy would say it's emotional. But you know, I found it unemotional. But we didn't think that it could work with uh, you know 
the direction uh, of the songs that we were writing. So we tried to re- do some recording at the end of 92 at the Roundhouse Studio in London um, with Jimmy Miller, who had produced The Stones and Traffic and Spencer Davis Group and Johnny Thunders and Motorhead. And um, but that never worked out because Jimmy wasn't in the best of shape and we weren't in the best of shape. And also we only had two songs, not enough to make an album. So those sessions folded after a while, you know, and um, then we reconvened, uh, I think in the spring of um, 1993, we'd had the idea to work with Ask Tom Dowd to produce. And um, we'd loved his work with uh, Aretha Frank. Uh, you know, I know he, Rod Stewart, and um, he, he'd worked with Eric Clapton. We didn't know that at that point, but you know, he'd record, he'd produced Layla, and um, he'd also produced The Cream, and um, or engineered The Cream. Uh, he, um, we didn't know that because we weren't into that music, uh, but we knew the soul stuff that he'd worked on. We knew we knew he'd worked with John Coltrane and My Favorite Things, and he'd worked with Aretha, and um, we were listening to a lot of Aretha and. Um, we needed a rhythm section, so we asked uh, Roger Hawkins and David Hood from the Muscle Shoals rhythm, rhythm section, because we loved their work, uh, you know, with the Staple Singers, with Wilson Pickett, with Boz Skaggs, with Willie Nelson, uh, Donny Fritz, uh, Luther Ingram, you know, they, they played in a lot of our favourite records, so we, they all, Tom and the the, 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 the Muscle Shoals guys came over to London and we had, they rehearsed with us for two weeks and um, so we worked up versions, early versions of the songs and then we headed down to Ardent Studios in Memphis, Tennessee mm-hmm. to make the record. Yeah. And Memphis for you, um, was that a bit like stepping into a musical holy ground because so much of the music that you've been influenced by and loved kind of came from that area that region that part of america so to actually you know land in memphis and be like we're going to make a new record was that a special thing it was very special we we had uh, been to memphis uh i think november 1991 we, and we went with andrew weatherall and we recorded some songs that uh became the dixie narco ep which uh, uh, was a top 10 hit in here in the uk the lead track was moving on up so we'd already sort of made a, a rock and roll pilgrimage to Memphis and, you know, went to Gracelands and Sun Studios and all that stuff. What and was your first impressions of all that? Those, those, because they're iconic landmarks all around Memphis. I mean, Graceland, like you mentioned, Sun Studio, kind of unassuming places, yeah. but such history in them. I never went to Sun Studios, actually. We, uh, we, we drove past it every day, but I never went. I was too... I had this thing when I was younger that if I went in, it would spoil the romance. Uh, I was wrong, you know. I, I went January this year. I finally got there, but I went to Graceland's in '91, and then that was special. All of us went, and um, also the studio that we were recording in, Ardent Studio. One of their favorite old-time albums had been recorded, uh, "Sister Lovers" by Big Star, so, and uh, that's why we went to that studio. Um, it was an adve- it was an adventure, you know. So, but really, we were mostly in the studio working. You know, we didn't have a lot of time. At, Get around. But I think, you know, the, there was the scene in Memphis had, it was a lot different from the 50s, 60s, and even the 70s. By the time we got there in the late 90s, it was, it seemed very quiet, you know. So, those sessions um, in Memphis, being in that room in Arden Studios, what are your key memories from that that time in 1993? I don't have a lot of memory because it's a lot, such a long time ago, and we've, I've made, we've made so many records and toured and written so many songs since um i've seen some film that uh, was shot and that that was that was a, that was nice to see uh, and i've um i've seen a couple of photos it's not that much we never documented ourselves in those days I, I think i was superstitious that if you had a photographer in the studio he would spoil the magic you know so which i think again was wrong but um Back then, and even still today, you know, making a record was a very, it was like a battle between good and evil, you know. It was like a, a real knife-edge stuff, so uh, the less people in the way, the better, you know. So it's a shame because we don't have documentation, but or we don't have much documentation. But um, I just remember working very hard, you know. we The band shared um, 
an apartment, six rooms or five rooms, and we every day, you know, we we get up and have breakfast, play table tennis, and then we go to the studio. And um, at twelve, I think midday, and um, start working with Roger, David, and Tom, and work until whenever Tom decided we should finish. Maybe have a couple of drinks after it, then go back back home, watch a bit of telly, and. Then Tom Dowd rem- demanded quiet, you know, he, de- he demanded respect because of his, he was a good, you know, he's a, he obviously he had a great track record in music and but he was a real gentleman and a really intelligent man and a very courteous, he was a gentleman and um, you, you know, you wanted to do your best, not just for yourself and your band, but for Tom, you know, for even, you know, we were flyer that he would want to work with us, you know. So, I mean, he was at 67 years of age at that point, and um, he'd had a, a long and illustrious career, as they say, you know, he's very successful. So, I was still writing a lot of the lyrics for the songs. I'd have, like, maybe a couple, you know, a few songs, I would have all the verses and choruses, and for some others, I would just maybe have, like, a first verse and a chorus, and I didn't have a second verse. You know, or a medley, or a code, or you know, or there was chunks of lyrics missing, and um, but you know, I had the the idea of what the song should be about, and um, so I, I felt that pressure when I was going in Memphis. I, I felt, oh my God, I don't, I don't want to hold this recording up. I, I got to deliver, you know, and also we had the pressure of following up Screamadelica, and then of course, and also Alan McGee had um, sold his label creation to uh, what Sony for a lot of money so they they want they wanted some payback as well i think so these original memphis recordings that people are going to get to hear now how did the conversations go when you came back from memphis you got this collections of songs did you as a band feel that they weren't right was that did that come out of the process of speaking to people like alan mcgee like how did it all happen it happened uh, immediately uh, in memphis when tom played as the these mixes we, th- three of us, Andrew, myself, and Robert Young, just we went in a room, side room, spoke for about twenty minutes, and uh, we came out of the room and we we said to Tom, well, we want to start remixing some of the songs, so we st- I think we began with Jailbird. We, we took the horns off because we felt the horns were covering up the the guitar. Robert Young's incredible filthy guitar riff. We started from there and then we start you know it was things that will turn the guitars up turn the drums down turn the vocal down you know turn the back and vocals down i take the horns off and and then we began doing things like um we re-recorded the song big jet plane in memphis with tom producing you know i mean the, the version on this album that had just been released is so beautiful why we wanted to re-record that i don't know because that song and that version of that song with that arrangement is the, the exact reason why we went to Memphis and worked with Roger, David and Tom in the first place. We must have been insane. Maybe we don't know why. Uh, it might have been a immaturity and insecurity in our part, you know. I don't know why. So then we went back to England and Alan McGee wasn't enthusiastic and he was normally very enthusiastic about Primal Scream stuff. Like when he heard her than the sun, for the first time he called me up and said, "We're gonna have to release this as a single. It's not gonna be a hit, but it doesn't matter because it's a statement. You've made the best record of the year, you know, and uh, the, you know, or the best re- record of the, the best single of the nineties. You know, he would, always was quite hyperbolic, and um, so I was like, okay, yeah, release it as a single. I, you know, I, I will proudly do that. But this time he was." Alan also actually made a, a trip to Memphis during the recording, and he doesn't. <laughs> How remem- was that? <laughs> well, he doesn't remember being there. Oh God! He uh, said he was stuck to a wall for three days. He was like fro. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Frozen, frozen on cocaine, and um, I, I don't really remember him being there vaguely. Apparently, Jeff Barrett, our publicist, was there, and I don't remember him being there either. Jeff, who runs... Uh, yeah, Heavenly. Heavenly. He was, yeah, I've got no memory of Jeff being there. So, it was... A f- it was and that's not just... You know, I, 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 we were sober uh, most of the time in the studio, you know. You know. Maybe a couple of lines, you know, to do some vocals or something, but we were mostly, you know, 
we're really together, so it's just such a long time ago. And um, but yeah, when we came back, there was no uh, real enthusiasm for the the recordings, and uh, well, I think we were all unsure. You know, Alan always wanted. Um, I think also as well, what we brought back were the remixes that we'd done, right? Which aren't as good as the Tom Dowd ones. You know, because um, row number one never let the band there the mix, <laughs> especially the guitar players. The guitar's louder. And um, Alan uh, from day one had wanted George Jaculius to produce because George was a friend of Alan's and he was a young guy. Like, he was the same age as us. He loved exactly the same music as us, but he was he had a lot of success with the Black Crows who were getting like selling a lot of albums. So Alan felt this would be good for us, but we. We were coming from a different place from the black, you know, from the black crows, and we were looking for something else, you know. There was this suggestion from Alan, why don't we ask George to remix the, the tracks? And and George said, well, you know, or I think he spoke to Andrew Ennis, and he said, look, if I if I just if I re-record the band, it will sound pretty much like what you've done with Tom. But why don't I just try and do some, you know, remix, you know, and uh, just try something slightly different, you know, and make it more stupid, you know? He goes, I can't make it any better, but I can make it more stupid. And th those were his immortal words. When they replayed the bass, the Andrew and his replayed the guitar, they whacked huge drum beat under rocks and under Jailbird, and I guess made it more contemporary, more, more 90s. And, you know, Al McGee felt that the, the Dowd mixes weren't edgy enough and um, they weren't contemporary enough because it, it was at the time of grunge, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and it was at the very beginning of Britpop and stuff, so... When we heard the George mixes of Jailbird Rocks and Crime Myself Blind, you know, they were, they sounded like hits, you know. And then we started re-recording the rest of the album, like Call On Me, I Think Everybody Needs Somebody's a Demo, on the original 94 album. And all this stuff was lost until Andreas found the tape in his, um, his uh, cellar two I was years ago. Say, so is it as I it's kind really of imagine? True. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, he was what, rooting around for... There's a dusty old box somewhere that he uncovered and found this stuff again, literally yeah. in his basement. There's a box full of tapes and dart tapes, cassette tapes and dart tapes. Right. And he um, did he get did, did he call you up and say, Look, "Hey, I found something you might want to listen to here." How did it happen? Well, he sent off for a cassette recorder because he, he didn't have one anymore. eBay special. <laughs> yeah, and but he sent off for one that could um, that had a, a plug that went from a cassette and the computer. Because he felt that maybe he would only ever have one chance of playing this, the tape would break. That's a smart move because it could have been lost forever. Then he's a smart guy, and um, he taped it. Then he sent an MP3 to me, and the the headline for the the heading for the email was "Look what I've just found." I was like, and I listened to it. I was like, "Whoa!" When I heard everybody needs somebody free uh, calling me, I was like, "My God, this is incredible." You know, we've got to release us. How do you look back on the whole experience then? Because like you say, you made a, some decisions whilst you're out in Memphis, you came back, you kind of almost, to an extent, rebuilt built the record and presented it in a, in a different light. So is it nice now to be able to, to share what is the kind of the nucleus, the original stuff there? It's a real pleasure to release this album and uh, let people hear what we what we did down there. For many years I felt a kind of creative wound that we'd gone to Memphis and worked with Tom and the Muscle Shows guys and we'd taken a bunch of really great songs and that we'd we'd messed up, that we had failed. And um, I honestly didn't know about this tape uh, because, you know, we, we toured together and then we went straight on a vanishing point. In 1995, I think, I took it, we all took a year off. 96 wrote recorded vanishing point and then we just from then on we just kept making albums and touring so this was just forgotten about because you know we we it was a very brave thing i think to go to memphis to work with these guys who no one knew about anymore they were old guys and we were like a very hit band we were young we'd made schemadelica we everybody loved schemadelica and they wanted schemadelica part two and we Went and made something we, totally different. Yeah, and um, but then we never released it. <laughs> but you know, so you can now hear the intention and the truth, and the. I think there's a lot. It's quite a sad record, and as I think it's a very raw, emotional, open record, 
And maybe that was part of the reason why we never released it like this. Maybe we were a bit embarrassed about it. Maybe, I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? Because the, I, I, I might be wrong there, because the albums that came after, like Vanishing Point, the shutters went up emotionally, the lyrics were less, they were more guarded and more hiding behind imagery. They were less direct. And then on a, the album after that, uh, Exterminator, it was just real anger and, you know, behind, you know, like an amphetamine or cocaine wall of rage. And, you know, we were kind of like, it was, everything was, it was outward anger to cover up the rage inside, you know. It was really, um, there wasn't hardly any fragility or tenderness in that record, you know. So, um, it was kind of like hiding, you know, you were kind of hiding behind rage, you know, and also the lyrics became more fractured. But they became more fractured because my mind was becoming more fractured and my life was becoming more fractured. So there's, you know, it's reflected in your art. But I think with this album, the Give Up, They'll Give Up original Memphis sessions, there's a real, it's kind of love lorn, and, you know, and it's like, um, the, the, I guess the narrator in the songs is a craving some kind of connection. You know, when, by the time you get Vanishing Point Exterminator, it's like, fuck connection. You know, it's like, fuck the world, fuck everybody. It's like, you know, it's like a cold rage and a complete disconnection. And um, I guess drugs compounded and helped that disconnection, you know, or that sense of isolation. So I think, you know, this is, you know, some people think that Vanishing Point was a come down for Schemadelica. This is, you know, this is, Schemadelica was the transcendent acid house, high energy, you know, kind of rave rock and roll record and you know it was at a time of possibilities acid house was a time of possibility that this record's a bit darker i think and a bit more yeah more raw and more open and i think it's interesting to hear that i really love this record you know yeah. i mean even like on the record there's a song called free and i i, I you know I, I never sang it and we we asked denise johnson to sing it and she sings it really beautifully and I still don't know why I never sang it. I think uh, I lost confidence, you know, or something. And um, but it's uh, I wrote the lyrics and I wrote the melody. I was like, you know, it was, it's a very open, emotional, truthful song. And um, yeah, I never sang it. So yeah, that that was a strange. That was strange. When you think of like the Primal Scream discography, then do you think there is an arc to you being? You talked there about the the rawness of of you've always loved like kind of raw confessional, very honest lyrics, and that's typified by a lot of the music that comes from the deep south and soul music. And then you said, I kind of shut down for a while, and I put the, you know the guard went up. These days, it feels like to me that the guard's very much back down again. So is that how you feel about things like you know maybe the that that time spent kind of being on a lot of. Uh, you know, chemically influenced things meant that you were you you felt a lot more, yeah, guarded. And then with not being, then there's like a rawness that comes to the fore. Is well, that I think you know part. You know, there's some, you know there's many reasons why uh, one would take drugs or alcohol. You know, and be addicted. But you know, um, I know that uh, I certainly know that it's to numb feelings of shame or humiliation or you know lack of self confidence and. Um, you know, lovelessness, um, you know, and I guess drugs, they, 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 they make you feel, you know, certain drugs or alcohol, you know, it can make you feel powerful for a while. Uh, when you're numb, you don't feel, and I guess that's why part of the reason you're taking the drugs, you're anesthetizing yourself, you know, you're, you're trying not to feel so that you can stay alive and uh, I guess function in some way. And um, and uh, part of the, the problem with that is that it definitely makes you, uh, yeah, it shuts you off from your feelings and your emotions and your, um, and you're, you're kind of hiding, you know, you're hiding in plain sight. So maybe some of the lyrical work uh, and the, 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 the sound of the records um, shows that, you know, um, um, because uh, as I said, the lyrics became more fractured, more you know yeah just a bit more symbolism more fractured a bit more still trying to express stuff but in a way that was hidden and maybe only i could understand what it was you know and um 
and um, maybe it was a fear of revealing myself, but I think the it's kind of like you're going deep inside. You're high, you know. You've got a strong interior life, and you you just don't you don't want to come out, and it's dep- it's really depression. I think you know it's like, you, know, you know that's it's like um, it's a reaction to depression. I think you know you you go really inward and you um, but at the same time because you're an artist you've got a creative origin you want to express yourself but you've got to find a different way of expressing yourself and maybe in this album the lyrics were you know very influenced by country music and soul music and blues music which is very honest direct raw and open and tells it like it is and to me that's my favorite type of songwriting and lyric you know lyric writing and um I really was, I wanted to become, you know, s- s- simply sophisticated or sophisticatedly simple, yeah. you know, like Hank Williams. And um, that was, that's my aim. And, um, and then, you know, I started hiding behind imagery and as I say, you know, fractured, cut up kind of stuff, like uh, influenced by William Burroughs and, you know, that kind of, but that was good as well because it's, you know, I, lo- I love words and I, I love playing with words and I love getting different meanings out of you know, f- f- you know, like um, you know, even when they use these political terms like collateral damage, <laughs> you know, when they 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 give you know like they take a phrase and give it a different meaning. Well, I like to take that phrase and give it another different meaning. You know, you know, um, you know. Also, the sound became harder with Primal Scream. You know, this was a also this record. The reason it's different is because it's bluesy and it's bluesy because of Robert Young's blues guitar playing, and Robert after this album sort of had a lot of problems you know and he um began contributing less to the band and so his guitar playing was he used to lead the songs these lead he would write these incredible riffs i would you know i'd write words and melodies that would that would um were sympathetic you know to the sound and the emotion that he was playing so whether it was you know something raw and dirty like jailbird or rocks or you know or something gentle like cry myself blind or everybody needs somebody i would but i had the same feelings and emotions as he had you know we 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 were similar in a lot of ways but um but when robert wasn't around you know creatively the band the sound of the band completely changed you know that's why vanishing point and exterminator sound completely different because and then this is a blues record that's why i love it as well and it's a blues record because of robert young the documentary then that goes along with the release of this of these memphis sessions um it's going to be broadcast on the bbc but tell me a little bit about how that's come together you got to go back to memphis for it that's yes. that forms part of it how did you find memphis in 2018 when we went to memphis in the, the 90s we were there was a lot of pressure on us to, you know, because we had to make a great record and we'd put this pressure on ourselves because we just wanted to make a classic album and, you know, and follow up Scheme of Delica. We just, we had this chance. We'd been waiting for years to try and, you know, be this great band and we finally felt we were a great band and we had it in us to make a great record. And so th- there was a big pressure, uh, that which we put on ourselves. You know, Alan McGee never put that on us or Sony. We, it was something that we put in ourselves. We were very hard on ourselves. So this time we went, as Andre and myself, we just, it was a, a bit more pleasurable because there was no, there was no uh, pressure. We just had to go and, you know, be interviewed in Ardent Studios and be filmed, you know, at Sam Phillips Recording Services. and. Meet Jerry Phillips, uh, with Sam Phillips' son. It's really amazing stuff. And we met William Eggleston, who was the photographer whose photograph was in the original Give It But Don't Give Up cover. We went to meet William, and that was lovely. So we had a lovely time. Throughout your career, Primal Scream have been characterised by always kind of moving forward, you know, always the progression of sound each time you've made a record, the look and feel of things. So this is the odd moment in... Primal Scream's career where you do a little bit of looking back I'm not saying this is like a wholesale kind of nostalgic thing but it's, it, you haven't done a lot of that over the career so was it nice to do just a little bit of reminiscing um, well it was, it was, it's been incredible because everybody that hears this album seems to love it and um, 
we're get we're getting really great reactions for it, and uh, indeed the BBC thought the story was so, so interesting enough to you know to commission a do- you know a documentary. So that was that was great, and you know I'm glad it it's about this album, you know, because I think it's a really beautiful album, and um, it's very heartfelt, and um, it really shows Robert to be a fantastic musician and um, a very soul, <laughs> soulful guy, you know, and a, an incredible musician and just a great guy. And he's dead now, and you know it's, but he's, I know it sounds a bit um, nostalgic or whatever, but. He's not dead because as long as you can hear this record, you can feel the soul of Robert Young. Whether, as I say, it's a dirty, filthy raunch of Jailbird or the, you know, the very priapic guitar player or the, you know, the, the broken hearted blues of everybody needs somebody. Um, this You can hear the man and his, and his music. After this trip to Memphis, what kind of conversations did you have with Andrew? Did it... It didn't make you think, oh, maybe Primal Scream could go back to Memphis one day and make a record. Well, funnily enough, we met um, David Hood. On this trip? Yeah, we met David Hood. He came up to to meet us from Muscle Shoals and he told us that um, there was a film about a famous studios in Rick Hall um, a couple of years back and um, which tells the story of Muscle Shoals' sound, you know, Muscle Shoals' music. Um, Dr. Dre had seen it and... Um, he loved us so much that uh, Dr. Dre and Jimmy Iovine came in with some money and said, why don't you build, rebuild the original studio? You know, 3614 Jackson Highway, I think it is. And, um, so they've rebuilt the studio and, it, you know, Sid Sumler mixing this in the 60s, 70s and apparently it looks exactly like it was back then. So he's invited us to go and make a record. So at some point it would be great to go to Muscle Shoals and play with the guys again. I don't know if David, uh, sorry, I don't know if Roger's still playing, the drummer, Roger Hawkins, um, but I think David's still playing, you know. Some of that Beats headphones money is going back into a... It's putting the back in, yeah. ...music productivity. Yeah, it's good. It's so so amazing. Yeah. Away from the the Memphis recordings that people are going to get to hear now, how are things with Primal Scream at the moment? You've played a, a smattering of gigs this year, but have you been you know, back with Andrew, kind of working hard as you normally do when you're away from touring? We recorded an album this summer, um, but we it's hard to explain what it is. It's something different, and um, we're still working on it. Um, indeed, we were working on it yesterday, uh, and we're still mixing. And um, But it's a very interesting project, and it's different, and it doesn't sound like anything we've done before. And But we don't know if it's going to be Prime or Scream. Okay. <laughs> we'll find out in due course. I know, I know, I know. It's, it's hard. I wish I could tell you, but it's... I, st- I still um, it's, it's fine it's still in the it's in the work in progress yeah it's, 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 it's going to be a beautiful album you know but it's it's emotional it's going back to emotion you know and uh, which is what I want to that's what I'll, that's all I want to do now is make emotional heartfelt uh, music that makes people feel you know that's it Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit loudandquiet.com.